What ho, Sidating? A real Maiden fan knows what that comes from. Dave. Dave. And uh, shall I just do the whole episode like Nico? Yes, you lovely bunch. How are you? Yeah, that won't get old. Yeah. In your <laughs> sticky, dirty, grubby little hands. Right, that's it. No more. <laughs> and welcome to the third episode of Maiden Cast, where we go through the entire Iron Maiden back catalogue, the greatest band to ever walk the land, and all the little nooks and crannies in between. It's going to be a journey. But this week, it is the number of the beast. Knob. Knob. The one that changed everything. The one that uh, there was no going back after this. So, where do we start? Where do we start? There's only one place you can start, isn't there? Start Things. from all the end, really, of Killers. Yeah. So, Paul Diano was uh, being a bit too naughty. It was only a matter of time, I suppose, before he ended up like the, all the rock star cliches. And um, he was fired from the band, or he left. Depends who you believe. And uh, little biography you read, doesn't it? Depends who's up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, mind you, even if he did leave, it's not as if they begged him to stay. No, no. Steve. Steve knew the writing was on the wall. He wanted to take it further, and Diano, as good as voice as Diano has got, which no one can deny, he's got a great voice. He couldn't do the stuff that Steve wanted to write. Imagine him singing "Allowed." You know, yeah, around. exactly. So, no, they had to, it had to happen. Bear with me here. I forgot to put me earphones in. Carry on. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they had a meeting at the Reading Festival as well. Um, Bruce was in Samson at the time. Uh, one of the books I'd read, it says that. I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been John Gallagher from uh, Raven. It might have been. But they said, when you watch Samson and you watched Iron Maiden, everyone, all the audiences were all basically going. Yeah, it was together. Yeah, it was. You've got a band, you've got a really good band with a singer that isn't quite on par with them. And then you've got one where the singer's really good, but the band... Can't keep up think, with him. I think I read a quote from Dickinson. He said, apparently, he watched Maiden one night and he said, fucking hell, the stuff I could do with this band. So, you know, they knew it. Everyone knew it. It was just like you say, it was a matter of time, wasn't it? It was, it was bound to happen. Yeah, so the inevitable did have them. And a um, really good story. I always like this one. Um, Bruce goes up to Rod's uh, office and he sort of goes, right, Sign here, sign here. You're on a hundred pound a week or whatever it was. And uh, meet up tomorrow at watch at such and such pub, and we're gonna have our first photo shoot and gonna announce it properly to the press and all that. And as Bruce walks out because the door, he went, "Oh, Bruce, come here." He reaches for his back pocket for about a couple of hundred quid on the thing. I mean, go get yourself a leather jacket. <laughs> yeah, none of that shit you're wearing in Samson and shave yeah. that tash off. Yeah, <laughs> and none so, of that Bruce Bruce shit either. Yeah, don't know what that was all about. Um, have you ever properly listened to Samson? I haven't, to be fair. It's they, I've never, you know, I just never, you know, there was more important things to listen to. I suppose I should do really, just to say I've done it. They're not bad. They're yeah, all right. Um, I imagine they were pretty much of a much like the rest of the new wave of British heavy metal. They all had their moments, I'd imagine. Yeah, it was more rock, more um, sort of Montrose. Oh, right. Know. I think I heard a live album of, of them at Reading once. That was pretty good as well. So um, I watched the Number of the Beast VH1 documentary yesterday. And they're talking about all about the recording of it, and uh, that's not a bad. Uh, it's yeah, as far as VH1 classic things go, it's not a bad little. Well, I imagine it's similar to the BBC thing where they did a classic album, didn't they? Oh, was it? Might be BBC. I thought it was yeah. VH1. 
I know, you can get it on DVD. Yeah, VH1 probably did one. But um, no, I know BBC actually, you know, that's how big the album was. The BBC actually sat up and took notice, you know. Yeah. Uh, recently, a few years back, uh, it won a poll. Did you see the HMV did a poll? Yeah, best, um, the most important British album, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the best best album to be released by a British band or artist and had to be released after 1960 or something. Yeah, and, and uh, when you think of the fucking names that must have been on that list, the commercial names... Well, I think, proper, I, think it got, it? I think it got groiped a little bit. I do think a few people got together and went, look, we can... Yeah, we can do it, but we, can have, we, not, you know? we can have a laugh with this. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, I think it did put a few no- noses out of joint. I think we. But we like expected. you like you said earlier, this is the album that changed everything. Is there more and a more important album released by a British artist? Don't get me wrong, I'm not shitting on other styles of music. There was probably massively successful albums released by people who weren't metalers. But when you think what Number of the Beast did for the genre, did for everything, there's uh, is there a more important album? You know, it's like, I, don't yeah, think- I mean, as much as I love, you know, British music, a lot of British music doesn't really connect outside because it sounds so English. Yeah. Um, yeah look at the trouble, the trouble bands that break in America. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure a much more represented of Britain would be something like Dark Side of the Moon or something about the Beatles or the Stones, something like that. But um, this album went worldwide. There were yeah. people, you know, you can go, I, I guarantee you, you can go fucking to the yeah. furthest part of the world and find someone that doesn't speak a word of English. But show them the album cover. and uh... Don't even show them the album cover. Show them a picture of Eddie. Yeah. And in perfect English, you'll go, I am Maiden. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that's the difference. And, uh, yeah, so I was... Um, if you read Bruce Dickinson's uh, biography as well, the thing with that biography that annoys me of all biographies is, um, especially all autobiographies, that is, they always go into massive depth on their first album, and then other ones is kind of like summed it's up in a sentence. Over, yeah. But he was saying that he, he really did feel a bit out of his depth w- with this. I think for all the uh, big and he get, gives it, you know, he uh, he was like, fucking hell, I'm recording yeah. with someone who, because I think Bruce Dickinson's vocal, like, singer, like his hero was Ian Gillen from Deep Purple. Yeah, and obviously so, you're Martin Birch producing it. Yeah. Who did yeah. him rock and all that, you know. I, I'm working with the guy that, yeah. you know, and... Uh, he uh, he says about what a hard time he had recording number of the beast, the track, and how long he spent on just that those first couple of lines. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, and that scream was just a scream of frustration in the end. <laughs> um, he just went right now, scream, and then he just went, yeah. <laughs> and it went. It was just pent up frustration. But um, he he said he said like he kind of got the ump and you know got a bit pissed off and Martin went, look, go and have a break and come back and clear your edge because you're not, you're not, your head's not clear now. And he said, I was sitting there with a coffee, just sulking and feeling sorry for myself. And uh, Martin Birch come and gave him a bit of a prep talk. He just sort of said like, look, you know, you, if you were shit, I wouldn't be working with you. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So get, you know, get your head in the right gear. You're in the right place. Let's go do this, you know. It was really good. It was a good little story, you know. So, let's get on with the music, I suppose. Well, I mean, don't forget, obviously, you've got a... He's a new nickname every album. Don't know if you've... you've Oh, yeah, go on. Oh, Farmer, this time. So, I don't know if it was... I don't know if he was doing that or whether it was just a band having a laugh. Yeah. But, yeah, Martin Farmer Birch. And um, I think... Obviously, we got we're talking about Dickinson being important to this album. You got can't forget that it's the swan song of Clive Burr. Yes, and let's not I, I, fuck about. It was the last meaningful recording that Clive Burr ever did because he yeah. swapped a few drum stalls, didn't he? But he's you know he's forever going to be the man that played drums on Number of the Beast. 
Yeah, I was going to get to that as we went on, but we might as well carry on. Talk about, um, talk about first and last, you know, it seemed, a, it seemed the right thing to do. Yeah. And- yeah, um, yeah. let's face it, he, he fell off the horse and never really got back on. He did do a band with Dee Snyder, though, apparently. Did he fucking up? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he did join another band, didn't he? But he... Oh, yeah, he did. One he did a couple of things when I was reading up, and he also... He, he, did an interview and said all the stuff that you read about why I left and why I was kicked out is all bollocks. You know, oh. it wasn't it wasn't because I was a fucking wasn't because I was a drunk. It wasn't because I had a bucket down the side of the drum kit every night. And that's bullshit. That never happened. You know, yeah, I like the party. Like all the other lads like the party, but I never let it fuck my shit up. And basically, he he got, he got fucking booted out of the band. He apparently it was like two days after his dad died. He had to take some time off from the tour, which is how Nico actually. Played the gig in a in a Clyde Burr mask in a Clyde Burr mask in a fucking Eddie mask. mask yeah. He took over some dates so Clyde could go back for his like dad who died, and pretty much when he came back, he, he said like as soon as I got back into the room with the other lads, something weren't right, and basically I you know it was a case of see you later. We you know he's going for a shit time, but we've got to do what we've got to do, sort of thing. And it was it pretty much for reasons unknown because he don't. It's not. He said it's not musical differences. It's not because I was a party animal. It's just something that just didn't work out once I came back, and it's, I think it's a bit of a shame actually. Yeah, I never heard. I, that's what I read about actually. That's in the um, official, the uh, one of the Hills book. Funny enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's. That's pretty much what what's in here. They say he he needed a bit of time off. Um, it was his dad, you say. I, I, I was going to say a dead relative. I couldn't remember. Yeah, he had to. Someone close to him died. He went to the funeral. I think he was getting a bit burnt out, and I think he needed a bit of a break. Probably, yeah. Because obviously and, they, they, were, they were full on, weren't they? You know, they were touring. Nico, touring races big Nico time, jumped actually. on bold. Apparently, Nico wanted to join anyway. Yeah, um, they I were did... mates anyway. It wasn't. That's what yeah, a lot of people think Nico stitched him up, but they were mates. It wasn't a case of that. Yeah. Nico loved Clive, apparently. So. Oh, well, no, I heard. Um, Nico stitched him. <laughs> See, it's, um, fucking, it's all Chinese whispers, isn't it? You just, yeah. you just don't know. Um, what, I what don't like. think that's. I don't believe that though. I think he 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 jumped at a chance when he saw it. Yes, um, but if the band didn't want to get rid of Clive, they wouldn't have got rid of him. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, obviously, look, they he played a bunch of gigs with them to fill in, and there was obviously a chemistry there. There was a bit of a yeah. thing, and they went, "Hold on a minute." They obviously saw. An upgrade, uh, a click, you know, yeah. and it was a bit of oh, yeah, it's probably a shame to let him go. And yeah, one of them shit decisions, but you've got to do it for the good of the band, sort of thing. But yeah, but I mean, he went out on a high, you know, his first UK number one album. I think he went straight into number one as well, and um, obviously top ten single with Run to the Eels. And um, apparently, they found out about the album while they were pushing their broken down tour bus through the snow. <laughs> which I think is fucking brilliant. You're like, you're like, you like, you know, everyone's going, lads, number of beasts at number one. And they're like, yeah, so fucking what? Like, help me push this lorry. Yeah. You no, know, it's like, that's rock stardom, mate. You know, it's probably, I love that story. Um, I think it's an important album for me, or a special album for me, because this is the bridge between the old and the new. Yeah. Um, if you take, well, <laughs> modern day Maiden, and it's, it's a unique album because, like you, like you summed it up perfectly, it doesn't sound like anything that went before it, but it doesn't sound like anything that came after it either. Well, I can, yeah, I can hear... In my ears, anyway. I can hear, so, a certain song like Invaders, um, maybe Total Eclipse of Ganglang. 22 Acacia Avenue, actually. I think those songs could, could be on Killers. Those I could see Paul singing. Um, but yeah, Children of the Dams, mm, little bit of maybe Remember Tomorrow, or certainly a step forward from Remember Tomorrow. But yeah, when um, The Prisoner, Number of the Beast, obviously Run to the Hills and Had I Been Our Name, that is right. We're moving forward now. Yeah. And um, if you take, well, there's a world of difference between Killers and Peace of Mind. Yeah, Iron Maiden and Power Slave. You know, it, it, if, if you if you'd only heard Iron Maiden, and then <laughs> lived under a rock, yeah, and um, 
went into a record shop and saw Power Slave and went, fucking hell. Oh, they've got a new album, have they? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it'd be like <laughs> night and day, wouldn't it? Put it on, you'd be like, whoa, yeah. So, but this still reminds me, and maybe Clive is that missing link. Um, yeah, I think you get he had a unique, He had a unique drum style, Clive. Yeah. I don't particularly, I never particularly liked it, but you could, I think I've said it before, you could never deny that he played the fucking shit out of that kid. Yeah, you've never said it on the podcast, actually. You've said it to me. But, yeah, so if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, it's just weird. From it's a, a drummer's drum perspective. It's a drummer thing, yeah. I never I never liked his parts, you know. It's, just, it's a strange one, because you can tell he's got all the ability in the world, and I'll never, anyone starts talking about, hey, if Clyde Bird's a shit drummer, I'll have him outside. But it was weird. I never liked what he wrote, and I prefer the songs from this era with Nico playing them. Don't know if it's a case of when I got into him, you know, you've grown up with Nico sort of thing and the people who, who were there at the start would see it differently. But I like I've got a bit of a unique look on it being a, being a drummer. But I, I think Nico's got a better sense of groove than Clive. Clive would put in intricacies that didn't, in my opinion, didn't really need to be there. Like the off-time snare hit in Number of the Beast itself, it for me, it completely kills the groove of the song. Uh, but, you know, it... it Fucking, it's all it's all subjective, you know, when it comes to music like that and musicians. But um, for me, you know, he, he was a great drummer. But you like you said yourself, you're not you're not saying he's a bad drummer by any no, stretch no, of the imagination. Far, far, fucking hell, no, far from it. Um, he was an awesome drummer. I'm pretty sure as well. Uh, Ralph Vieira, a um, American YouTuber, um, he's a podcaster as well. He's got a great channel. He's got a couple of great channels actually. But um, he was saying when he got Number of the Beast, he didn't realise they had a new singer. He said when he he saw Iron Maiden in the shop, like so, he, like, Ralph's in his fifties now, so he was in a record shop and saw Iron Maiden, saw the cover, and was like, "Holy shit, who's this?" Yeah. And he turned it around. And he went, "Well, they look like Priest," because he said that there was special, <laughs> yeah. like there was a particular one with Dave Murray, like holding his guitar yeah. in the air, and he said he looked like a bit like KK Downing, and and obviously Paul Diano said that he looks cool with the braces and that the braces, the hand. Spikes yeah, and yeah. and um, if oh this is cool, I'll just he just bought it there and then took it home, played it, loved it, and then when he got number of the beast, he put it on and went, what the fuck? Yeah, and he thought he thought like is that it wasn't until he looked actually looked into the thing because Bruce wasn't on the back apparently, or he didn't look at the back at least. Yeah, yeah. but it wasn't until he looked through it, he was like, oh, new singer. So that. Must be a um, unique, like a weird thing. I know as well, some people do prefer Paul Diano, but I, I, the majority of the people I know that prefer Paul Diano were into, were, were there at the beginning. Yeah, it sort of ties into the fact that Sad Dickinson got his nickname of the Air Raid Siren, wasn't it? Because apparently some geezer was like, when he joined, he was like, yeah, fucking great. I've got to listen to an Air Raid Siren singing some of my favourite songs. No, thanks. <laughs> and that, and that, that, that nickname stuck. Yeah, I mean, one of the guys I worked with um, a while ago, actually, I said he was into, and I went, did you like Iron Maiden? And he went, yeah, I just didn't like him when Bruce joined. So I stopped. That's like, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, fair enough. Fucking crazy. But no, yeah. you know, like, everyone got their own opinion. And he like saw him with, back in the day. Well, fair, fair play, play to Clive, because if you can honestly say that and then, like, bow out of Maiden in 1981 and never go back, that's, you know, you've got to be... You got to be a true believer in the old Diano, you know. And I, I respect the I respect the guy's attitude really for doing that. It's that as well. I mean, I'd rather him just go. No, I'm just not into him anymore. So I, and then moved on to something else. Then still bitch about it to this day, <laughs> as if he's going to come back at some point. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so into the music, um, Invaders. A song they never play live. Have they ever played it live? Do you know? Um, I don't think they did because they didn't. It shows you how much. Cause, no, because Steve don't actually like it. He wished he could have had another song to open the album. Because if you look at Beast on the Road tour, they opened with Murders in a Room Walk. That's right, yeah. And they pretty much always used to, or always have opened a set with the lead tr- with the first song on their new album. 90% of the time, So for yeah. them to go back to Killers to do it shows how much they didn't really like invaders they just put it on there because i think steve said with that in gangland they didn't have nothing else to fucking put on there 
because they were literally writing from scratch now. They'd used up all the wealth of stuff, hence why they're rework, trying to rework Invaders to get it to where he thought would work with Dickinson, and they were writing from scratch, so they didn't have nothing else, because apparently they spent so long in the studio writing, they fucking run out of time to record. They had to record it in like five weeks or something. They spent so much time writing songs, so they didn't have fuck all. And it was a case of, right, right, lads, we need to fucking start recording, otherwise we're going to run out of time. And they were like, oh, shit, we just better go with what we got. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what else. I'm maybe opening up with Number of the Beast or something like that. But, I mean, that yeah. opened the best of. So. Yeah, I mean, you got a moody intro tape and that could have worked. Yeah. But um, I, think it's a good in- I think it's a good opening track. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's all it is, though. It is yeah. just an opening track. That's it, yeah. It's, it's just... You know, it's just a, it's just an opening song. Yeah. It to me, this is the James Bond. The five minutes you get at the beginning, you get a little action sequence yeah, yeah, before the rest of the, the rest and of then the, the film actually starts. It's just a little introduction. It's just a little thing to get you, and you're in. You know, yeah. opening credits. Now the film starts, and um, that's how this song is to me. Yeah. Because you've got yeah, some no, epic, epic on here. Yeah. And I'll, that, so it serves its purpose in that way. It just sets the tone. It introduces the new singer. Uh, it's fast. It's, you know, it's a good, it's a good maiden song. I mean, yeah. I think it's one, of, it would have been like one of those ones at the end of Killers, maybe. But yeah. um, again, the most important album to ever. <laughs> yeah. And, it <laughs> and, and it's that. not even Maiden's best album. And it yeah. opens with one of their weakest. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, songs. isn't it? It's crazy. <laughs> but, um, I mean, yeah, you know, it's a good opener. It's got great verses. The fucking verses are brilliant. You know, Longboats have been sighted and the evidence of war has begun, really showing off all of them. They're all fucking pumped up. We're having Dickinson there. He's giving him a shot in the arm. Steve Harris's bass work is all over the place. Like we were talking about, you know, he's, he's not just a bass player. He is a fucking lead bass player. I mean, they, you could argue they had three guitars in before they had three guitars because... And I've, it's, I think it's one of the first times I've ever actually listened to the album at, like, using decent headphones and listened to it on Spotify, the remastered version. And the fucking hell, the bass, it's so much going on. It's unreal. Yeah. And it's it, it fucking, you know, pe- no wonder he's always revered in the in the polls every year in the magazines because he's, he's a fucking, he's an awesome bass player. Mm. He does things that guitarists wouldn't think to do, you know, let alone bassists. And he's, he's, he proves it again from minute one on this. Yeah, well, we're off to a good start because that that our, that song normally gets a lot of shit from people. So I'm glad we uh, both yeah, like no, it. You know, it's, I mean, it's what it is. You know, it's not a bad uh, song. It's just and not only that, I, if I was watching Iron Maiden next week and they just sort just dropped it, dropped say, it in, I'd be well happy. Three songs in, yeah, just as if the place wouldn't fucking erupt. Yeah, I know. Come on, yeah. So. I don't know the is, uh, the um, bit of a reject, but I think I think a, it's a not as bad as people give it. No, nah, no fucking no way near. So um, it's worse on the album. Uh, an album that I uh, wanted to get into. A lot of people oh, I wanted to. A lot of people don't take um, Black Sabbath with without Ozzy, and it's a shame because they miss a lot of. Uh, a lot of God music and Ronnie James Dio was obviously a big influence to um, Bruce Dickinson and um, an interview with the solo DVD he did. It was a collection of solo concerts. And then on the third disc, there's a really in-depth interview where he goes through every album. And uh, there's a little bit of, uh, he talks a little bit about of Maiden and he goes, um, yeah, and he's talking about Ronnie James Dio, and he sings the song to "Children of the Sea." He goes, "Children of the Sea, Children of the Damned." Oh, oh, I don't know what happened there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so he basically admits there and then that it, he ripped off <laughs> "Children yeah. of the Fucking love Children it. of the Sea," although it is based on "Children of the Damned." It's a um, the film sequel, book. sequel to "Village of the Damned," I believe. Is that right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, very good song. Nice, moody, atmospheric, slow number. Nice little heavy chorus. 
Of course, it goes off on one at the end. Yeah. And uh, another one I miss in the live set. They've, they've never done this when I've seen them, I don't think. They yeah, may have uh, done it on on one of their greatest... Well, I say greatest hits. It's not really a greatest hits, is it? They do. I'm trying to think. I'm sure I've seen No, they, they might have done it on the... Um, what was the one where they concentrated on... I don't know. They might, have, they might have done it recently, thinking of it. I think I might have seen them do it. Uh, yeah, it was I'm on, sure sure it was on one it. of the tours where they dive in. Deep, yeah. deep. But no, I mean, like you say, it's, it's a great song. Um, for me, it carries on the Prodigal Son vibe a bit from Killers. You know, the sort of folk intro. I think it tapped, Steve tapped into something with that and he thought, right, I can really fucking explore this, especially with Bruce coming in now. I think he thought, right, all bets are off. Let's just go for it. He, uh, you know, more has more Harris wizardry on the bass guitar. Some of it's fucking amazing playing, and Bruce singing his ass off, really putting his stamp on the band. And you can tell he had a uh, a lot of influence on the writing. But even though he, he couldn't, apparently couldn't get a credit because of a uh, contractual bollocks with Samson, so he, his name couldn't actually appear in any of the songs. But you tell he's all over him. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? He he never he, he on paper he never wrote anything, but he pretty much did, which which kind of avoids him getting royalties from this album. Surely yeah. they must have. Oh fucking Smallwood would have sussed that out. Yeah, don't, you know, don't fucking don't ever think that Dickinson ain't getting paid for this album because Smallwood would have sorted that out big time. Yeah. there's no no way that that would have gone by the wayside. So up next, the prisoner. Oh, what a fucking tune. Again, another song. I'm sure I've never seen this done live. And I've... Yeah, if you well, if you saw... Um, thing me. Uh, fucking hell. Where they combined... Uh, somewhere back in time, they played it. Did they? Yeah. Oh, no, but I mean recently since I've seen oh, it. Oh, no, not I think a... they may have done it on Made in England as well. Yes. But, yeah, I... I absolutely love this song. I listened to the album earlier on today, and um, yeah, I love the. Uh, it's an all time, it, isn't it? This <laughs> they they should play this during. They should have played this during one play of the uh, every set, mate, because it's it's banging. Yeah. Is <laughs> is a one word for it? Well, I think they should have played it during a montage in one of the Rocky films. Because <laughs> that's how this song makes me feel. It makes me feel like I can yeah. run ten miles and. <laughs> If I'm playing it and there's a mountain, I could easily run to the top of it. If I've got this song, it, it just makes you. Yeah. It just it makes you feel so good. This track, the yeah. the chorus. And do you know? Do you know why? Because the first writing credit on the song isn't Steve Harris. It's Adrian, Adrian Smith. Smith. Yeah. One of he I, thinks his first proper fucking. Hello, I'm here and I can write songs. And yeah. Fucking hell, did Maiden benefit from that? Because he is a phenomenal songwriter. Phenomenal, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. You know, he, he fucking, you know, it starts off. I mean, obviously, you got the spoken word intro from the the you know, old obscure British sci-fi series, The Prisoner, and um, I'm sure everyone knows the story of the phone call that and make to get the right. Yes, story. <laughs> legendary. The but, one um, time Rod was nervous. Yeah, which completely flies in the face of remind me when we do peace of mind about the story that completely is the opposite of the story they had with Patrick McGoon. But, um, yes, I know what you're yeah. referring to. Yeah, yeah okay. we'll get there. But I mean, it starts off drum intro, no fucking bad, nice and simple. It's not, it's not a drum feel. It's just a beat, and it's heavy as fuck when them guitars come in. It's about as heavy uh-huh. as they get. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's amazing, and it's the, the, the musicianship on show between, especially like the, the two guitarists here, Murray and Smith. They're really starting to sink in with each other. Because they trade solos. I mean, the set ball's fucking on. The you know, fret ball's on fire, mate. You know, there's the song has everything going for it, and it's it's an all-time classic for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice heavy riffs. It's a straightforward song as well. It's yeah, it not is. There's no fucking about. It's it's a bit of change of pace in the middle section over the yeah. solo and that. But no, it's just it's amazing. Yeah, you know, it's too many superlatives. I can't. You know, I can't use enough to describe this song really. Yeah, and a, and again, it's a, a really good feel good song as well. I always have a smile on my face when I hear it. And I remember the first time I heard it, um, 
I hadn't completed my collection yet, and someone actually lent me this album. And I just remember hearing that, that when I first heard that song, it was like, right, this this is a, this is worth buying the album for. Just, this just is an yeah. album track. And yeah, it was just, I, I knew then I have to dive deeper with this band. There's going to be gold on every album. And yeah, that's a, a, a favourite of mine, definitely. And then, Luke, are you feeling sad, depressed and lonely? Yeah. Because I know, do you know a place. place. Do you know I can say? Do you know a place where I can go? Yeah. Um, yeah. The sequel to Charlotte the Harlot. Yeah, she has an address, which makes you think: was she actually real, or was it just one of them houses? You see, yeah, you, know, you always get like a monster squad, but they go, "Don't go near the crazy man's house." You know, is it just a, a house that rumours started, and there's just some poor bitch living there who <laughs> just gets accused of being a prostitute? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure if it was based on. I don't know. There might have been some some woman that was in the bar who was known. As yeah. a, you know, picked that might that she might have picked up punters from certain places, or I think it would have come out by now. Those... <laughs> you don't know, do you? Yeah, a story like that's too good to get away, isn't it? And bloody hell, if you were a lady of the night that did happen to get shagged by Paul Diano. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you would have come out by now. I'm sure you know. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? We should have asked him when we met him. Yeah, with Charlotte the Harlot. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it's um, it's an unusual song structure where they start it and the verse is almost like, you know, there's no, no flow to it. It's weird that they, they the writing's changed again and Smith is heavily involved in this again, and um, I think it's a good song. Bruce using this full range of vocals goes from every you know he doesn't miss a beat on this song you know it's one when it starts off i'm like yeah but i, I tend to it bores me midway through but then it kicks back in at the end and it's like yes you know and it's it could yeah. do with being a bit shorter i think it's kind of it starts off kind of like an acdc song really like that da -da, yeah. lonely. Da -da -da. i know a place where we like you can see bon scott uh you know like when he does um whole lot of Rosie or yeah. Dirty Deeds done Dirty Deeds done um, dirt cheap. Dirt there cheap. we go. Right. So <laughs> Got there in the end. Just... <laughs> but when like when Bon Scott Bon Scott told the story and like when he he would kind of he'd tell the story and he'd it, it, with his hands he'd talk with his hands. Yeah. And, and then he'd sort of look at the camera and wink. And then <laughs> carry on. Yeah. So like out for all that I can get, and there you go. If you know what I mean, <laughs> you know. And um, yeah, I, like the story of Rosie, she was real. You know, a whole lot of Rosie. Yeah, Rosie was real. Oh, right. Yeah, um, right. Uh, apparently, yeah, Bond went with a woman who was of larger <laughs> nature. Right. Yeah. They were taking the piss out of him the next day, and he just went, "I don't care." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I, yeah. You all funny. went on a bus and knocked one out. I yeah. was, I was in some. <laughs> so yeah, Bomb being a boy went, fuck it, I'm gonna write a song, take the piss out of me. But um, but yeah, it kind of starts off like that, and especially yeah. um, when like, a whole lot of Rosie finally does kick in when you can see she has it up. Yeah. Bah, na, 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 you know. Yeah. And um, it kind of reminds me a little bit like that when it does kick in. And then it actually reminds me, structural-wise, actually reminds me a little bit like Transylvania or something like that. Because it does remind... It, it, you always think it's a straightforward rock song, but it's not. Yeah, no, it no, 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 there's always, you know... There's all sorts of hills and peaks and valleys yeah. that the song goes through. Yeah. Um, there's even like a little slow, sort of heartfelt bit in the in there as well, and then it kicks yeah, into... Like, well, like there was in the... Uh, like, like, like there was in the original... Yeah. Like you said, it's almost like their morality tale, isn't it? You know, mm. trying to convince it to uh, not do it. Yeah. Can't you see you're throwing your life away? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it does go off on. It, and it's only four minutes as well. You'd, I, it does feel a no, lot it's longer. That's six minutes. Is it? 22 yeah. case, case you're having, yeah? Oh, I've got four, four minutes 49 here. Yeah? Oh, fucking hell. Well. But like you say, it. Yeah goes off on so many different things you you're lured into thinking it's a longer yeah. song than it is 
And uh, just like that, uh, side A is done. Yeah, let's flip this baby over. And uh, who? So yeah, the uh, one of the most famous songs in all of heavy metal. Um, to this day, some people think the band are Satanists. Yeah, um, pricks. A particular religious friend of mine, um, I said that's literally one song out of like 15 albums. Based on um, a nightmare that he had after watching um, Omen 2. Yeah, the, the song, you know, there's a song about the prisoner on there. There's, you know, and um, he hit, but to which he replies, you only have to sing one. One, uh, one, is, one is all you need. Stop it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm at times, you know, I, you, you must know the story of all the weird shit that went on during recording. Yeah, the old, yeah. The old, the old recording gear breaking down and fucking Martin Birch crashing into a busload of nuns and all that shit. Um, didn't he the get repair, it? Repair yeah, bill the coming to 666 car, quid, yeah. yeah. <laughs> fucking bizarre, mate. Well, what more proof do you need? That's it, yeah. That's it. <laughs> They're all millionaires now. Yeah, Come on. exactly. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean the older. It's like it's like boxing a cloud of smoke. You just yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, you need to do it. it. But um, well, I'm trying to think. The first time I heard the song, um, I'd heard clips of the song on certain adverts, and you know, but the first album I bought was actually um, Best of the Beast. Um, I saw saw it in a sale. I just thought, right. Yeah. Let's see what this band are all about, you know. That was my first one, and then I went on to get Brave New World. Um, so this was the first track I properly that, that played on there. Obviously, you've got the spoken word intro. Who did that, by the way? Just some they, random. They wanted yeah, Vincent Price. They couldn't afford him. Yeah, 25 grand he wanted. And uh, Rod, Rodney Smallwallet was like, nah, mate, you can fuck off. So um, they got some random in, and it's you know, <laughs> just as good a job in all fairness. Yeah, I hope he's getting royalties. Um, it wasn't Michael Jackson in Thriller that was the first person to use Vincent Price. It was actually Alice Cooper, the Black Widow. Oh, right. um, and the bass line from Thriller was nicked from a Rick James. Was it Rick James, the guy that did uh, Super? Yeah, doom, do do do. Oh, right, MC yeah. Hammer, the bass yeah. line. <laughs> yeah, well, apparently well, one of his songs. MC Hammer didn't write that. No, no. <laughs> and um, and yeah, David Bowie um did a Vanilla Ice cover back in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that um, the story of the song lyrically to me is is someone who stumbles across a satanic mass. In, yeah, in many ways. If you jump forward in time 20 years, you got basically the lyrics for Dance of Death. Yeah. He, 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 basically, he basically, and I think he sees someone being sacrificed or whatever, and he goes, I can't, this can't be done. I must inform the law. Yeah. He runs yeah, he off a, to tell someone, but yeah, too late, he's after, mesmerized um, and he's drawn in. After uh, watching Dame, uh, Omen 2, wasn't it? He had a nightmare. So, um, that's the film that set it off. He was watching Omen 2 late at night, went to bed, had a nightmare, and then wrote this based on the nightmare he had. I think there's a poem as well that it's, like, it's loosely based on as well. I think yeah. it's a mixture of the two. But that was how I read the lyrics anyway. Someone stumbles across a... Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. And then... Um, but, yeah, uh, one of one of the... Um, the formative songs of my maiden really because as much as these first couple of albums are great and i love them and we've mentioned before that certain elements or certain styles are left behind it's because they were still forming they were still yeah. finding themselves but this was one of those songs where it came together oh yes yeah, it's, and, it's uh, gold isn't it pure yeah. gold and um you know what's it probably the most famous metal song of all time do you think? Yeah, not not the best, the, the most famous. No, no, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Number of the Beast, you know, everyone knows that song. I would have said Ace of Spades. I would have thought anyone, everyone knows Ace of Spades, don't they? No, I, I would I would argue for Number of the Beast, purely okay. because it's subject matter and everyone's, you know, it brought up such a fucking stir of passion in all the, the Christian right in America and all that. Yeah. Uh, it's it, That's what put them around the world. 
as a member of the beast, I would say. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, oh, I'm, I'm not sure what to say about the song, really. I mean, no, what do you that say about the number of the That beast? hasn't been said already. You know, it yeah. is, it's, it's another all-time classic, isn't it? I mean, I, I, do, I will just say I do love the riffs. The oh, yeah. yeah. and, then, and that just stays all the way through, even with the drums. It's just a... Yeah, but as I alluded to earlier, it's Clive yeah. drum beat. That pre- it, it, doesn't, it bugs the shit out of me. It kills any momentum the song has. It doesn't kill it, that's the wrong word. But because it, it's an offbeat snare, it takes all the groove out of it. Yeah. And I think even, even Nico tries to not accentuate it so much. Because it's, it's a song should flow. But Clive did that on purpose to deliberately stop the flow of the song. And, um, you know, it, it annoys me. But that, that gripe aside, you know, the song is, you know, it's top 10 metal song of all time without even thinking about it. Um, one section as well as I love is the... Um... No. Yeah. Before the section... You've got the solo a bit, but then the, yeah, the, it, it breaks down to, and then that yeah. the, the tone of those calls yeah. then just sounds oh, yeah. evil. Yeah, and then, when, yeah. It, when it leads into um, Agent Smith solo. Yeah, and that solo is just it's just magic. It just sears the fretboard off, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's just crazy. But can you ever think about that solo without thinking about the piss poor video they made for it? Yeah, the videos. All them dancers. <laughs> yeah, one of them spins around with Ed and just Ed becomes like a werewolf. Werewolf yeah. mask. But, you know, great Maiden songs go hand in hand with terrible videos. Yeah, let's face it, they've never really <laughs> been. <laughs> they didn't because they had to, because it's like, right, we need to get on MTV. So they made they made videos. You know, we'll, we'll get round to their best, worst video as we go through, but they never topped Holy Smoke. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. But no, I mean, you know, it is. I'm trying to think of a good one, to be honest. There ain't one. There ain't one. Maybe can I play with madness? Oh yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's probably yeah. their best video. But yeah, but no, they they were never about videos. It was always about the songs for me, which is refreshing, especially during when MTV was fucking grabbing everyone by the throat. Yeah. So. Are you done with Number of the Beast? I'm done with Number of the Beast, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the ultimate highs on the album, and I'll, I'll lead us into the next one because it goes down to yeah. one, like a, a song that over time has worn me down and worn me down and worn me down, and I don't care about it no more. Yeah, this is the problem. Um, I remember with um, Metal Show yeah. with Gully and Joe, we did what we're doing now with Black Sabbath. Yeah. And when it came to reviewing Paranoid, we really struggled. And yeah. it was a really short show. And it was just... We were both just sort of, I don't know what to say. It's yeah. War Pigs. How do you review War Pigs? Yeah. And how do you review Paranoid? And uh, I really I really tried to sort of disconnect the fact that I'd heard the song a million times. Yeah. And just try and zoom in on the song, you know, and... It was really hard. And it's kind of, I've, all I can explain really is the first time I heard Run to the Hills. And again, it was, I'd, I'd known, I'd heard the chorus and things like that. And um, I think it was on a compilation of some sort. And it, it was Iron Maiden. But I was really taken in by the. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, it's such a, it is, let's not fuck about. I mean, as the song goes. And that riff never comes in again in the song. No. They, they, they just use that once. Yeah. You know, it is an all-time classic. No one can argue that. But, you know, it, it, it ended up in an episode of Open All Hours, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. listening to it on his headphones. You know, it's an all-time classic song. But as far as... Oh, fucking hell. I mean, you know... It's a great song. Sing along. It's great. It's, it's the first time they really got political with their lyrics as well. Yeah, actually sung it? about real life shit. I know not political yeah. is one word, but actually sung about something that was real. Yeah, historical, I yeah. suppose. You know, and, um, you know, it, it, yeah, I can't, well, I'm not dissing the song because you can't. You know, again, it's probably a top 10 metal song 
a lot of people would fucking name it as their best favourite Maiden song of all time. But for me, it's the ultimate momentum killer. I mean, case in point, Legacy of the Beast Tour. That set was on fire from the choice of songs they played. And they've just played Hallowed. And you know, there's one song left. And you're like, right, let's keep this momentum up. Let's play Running Free. Let's go straight into it. Dun, bam, bam, dun, dun, you know, upbeat. And it comes in with Run to the Eels with a shitty fucking kick drum and a hi-hat. And it just killed everything. For me, at least. You know, all the, other, all the other casuals were going, oh, yeah, it's run to the hills. But for me, it, it killed momentum and it, it kills momentum on the album. But I don't know if that's just, I've just been worn down by it now. Yeah. You know, I'm jaded. I, I do remember the um, Rock, Rock in Rio because that was, a, that was a video on its own. That was on like yeah. Krang TV. And, yeah, yeah. And that was really good. And they do play it really well then. But yeah, I think... Every every band has that song yeah. that yeah, um, that everyone knows and everyone likes, but the fans are sick to death of. You know, yeah. um, I'm I'm sure Motorhead fans could have happily had I'm Motorhead not spades played spades. spades. Yeah. Um, even something more mainstream like Muse, plug uh, pretty much any Muse fan can't stand plug in Baby. Um, fucking Nirvana was smells like Teen Spirit. Yeah. Uh, Nirvana Metallica was... with Sandman, even though yeah. Sandman came late in their later on in their career. Yeah, it was still probably their most played song ever. Yeah, but yeah, like in Nirvana, in the end, they just stopped playing it. Yeah, <laughs> they just got sick of it. So yeah, I, it's one of those songs, and every band gets one. If anything, it must be the sign of success when I mean, you have that one. Oh yeah, your most successful song is the one that everyone's fucking pissed off with. So. Yeah. But yeah, again, it's run to the hills. What what can you say that hasn't been said a million times before? Yeah. So, and then this is where I get confused. This always Ganglang was on the album. Total Eclipse wasn't. Yeah. Is that right? right. Yeah, they basically it was flip a coin. Pretty much, they had a choice between Gangland and Total Eclipse, and they chose Gangland. What? Yeah. I mean, even Steve Harris says today he said I don't know why we did that. Because they, yeah. because they actually played Total Eclipse live on that tour, and not game. <laughs> yeah, and that was, was it. You know, B, it wasn't it a double A side with a single though. Something no, like no, that. it wasn't. No, Total yeah. Eclipse. Total Eclipse was a B side to Run to the Hills. Oh, I see. Okay. Back in the days when you had songs left over, you put them on your fucking singles as your B side. Yeah, well, that was your B side. Yeah, a lot of times B sides were fucking songs that you loved. But yeah. I mean, you know, Gangland. Don't get me wrong. It's a, you know, it's just a, it's an upbeat song. And it's Clive Burr's first writing credit. Oh, really? Yeah, he wrote it with Adrian Smith. It's got a mad old drum feel at the start. You know? Yeah. Play, and it's, it's upbeat, it's all the rest of it. It's, um, but it's filler. And even the it band themselves have said it's yeah. filler. Yeah, it's filler. It's pure and simple. Um, again, it's, in, it's, it's fun, it's enjoyable. Yeah, you know, it's only a three-minute track. It soon goes. It kind of again for for Iron Maiden, it's pretty straightforward. It's not very adventurous song. Yeah. Um. And again, I, we say it didn't get played live on the thing, but I think it would have gone down well live. I think it would have been like a good little long course. Song. Oh yeah, it would have been yeah. like um, Drifter or something like that. Um. Yeah. Odd one, really, to be honest. Um. It kind of. After Run to the Hills, you know, that, that big scream, da, 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 bum. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of just picks things up again, you know. It does. And which, it, it, which again, it, which, you know, you're, you're saying that, it brings me back to my point of Run to the Hills being a momentum killer. Yeah, yeah. Everything about the song is... Even though it's this classic sort of, I can't leave it alone. It's like I'm like a dog with a frisbee. But it just, it sucks the fucking energy out of the room. To the point where we're talking about how Gangland picks the energy up. And Gangland is probably the ultimate filler song. And you think that that's the bridge, really, from Run to the Hills to Hello Be Our Name. Just this yeah. nice little yeah. palette cleanser in the middle. Yeah, big time, yeah. Because obviously T Total Eclipse wasn't there. I mean, we'll talk no. about it now. Because it's on the reissue, yeah. not on the new reissue, though. No, they took it off, but like like they did with Sanctuary and uh, yeah. Twilight Zone, took them off, yeah. didn't they? Yeah, don't know why. But there you go. But um, 
but yeah, I mean, Total Eclipse, it's um, another Clive Burr writing credit. I mean, he, he must have had his Weetabix before they went in the studio, wrote two songs, or helped write two songs. I mean, drummers never write songs unless you're Charlie Benanti. Yeah. You know? But yeah, too, I mean, and he, he co-wrote this with um, Dave Murray. Dave Murray, had, had, again, has his song and album, and invariably one of Dave Murray's songs on the album are one of the best, and this is fucking, this is a great song. Yeah. Fucking great song. I mean, it's... What, why they pick Gainland over it, I'll, you know, that'll be the eternal question. It ain't like does God exist or is, uh, is Atlantis at the bottom of the fucking ocean? It's like, why did Maiden not put Total Eclipse on <laughs> Have it? you seen, yeah, have you seen that meme where they've got the couple in bed and he's, oh, yeah. the guy's turned yeah, away? It's like, that, yeah. it's like, is he thinking of other girls? And yeah, it's, it's like, it's like no, stuff. why did Maiden put Total Eclipse on it? Total Eclipse get left <laughs> Yeah, fucking right and all. But I mean, it's, like I said, they actually played it, they played it live on the tour. Now, most people on the tour, unless they got run to the old single, would have been, what the fuck is this? Like, there would have been any, though. Yeah, yeah. But any any casuals who just jumped in, they'd be like, whoa, okay. But, but I mean, it's the magicianship on this song is on another level. The guitar solos are insane. And I think the first time I heard this was on 12 Wasted Years, the video, the home video they did, the little uh, biographical thing they did. And they played a clip from... Beast over Hammersmith, which was the they were supposed to release that as a live album video, but for some reason it never came off. That's why it ended up on the early days DVD. Yeah, you can. Um, someone's put it on YouTube. Yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty, hodgepodge. Yeah, it's they pretty set because the, the the audio is on the Eddie archive. Yeah. And I've this someone's put it all pieced it together. It's pretty clever what they've done. Um. It's worth watching as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, what can I say? This is this is one of the best songs on the album, and it's not yeah. on the album. Yeah. yeah. I'll always go back to it. And if they played this live, I would, I wouldn't be able to contain myself. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be up for that. I mean, that's the thing as well. I mean, a lot of the bands at the moment are doing, I'm, I'm a fan of it. I used to clash with Gully, he didn't like it. But I like I like it when a band does an album in full. Yeah. I, I I get that it, it's become a bit of a trend and a bit of a cash grab and a bit of a gimmick. Um, but in these testing times, even before this bollocks kicked off, if if it filled a venue, yeah, what the fuck are they meant to do? Yeah, so, um, I was just talking to um, Nigel from Onslaught, and uh, they did the thing where they were doing the false in full. The tour ended. It was meant to be like a string of dates, just to, you know, tip the hat to the album. Yeah, yeah. They ended up touring for two and a half years. <laughs> they went all around the world. They went to Japan. They went to Russia. Went to Australia. Oh, I mean, yeah. The fucking phone just never stopped ringing. Yeah. And like we were playing places. I mean, we literally did a world tour. <laughs> I mean, and we we couldn't turn it down. It was yeah, what we just do. Turn down money, you know. Yeah, like no, nah, don't want that. Thanks. And um. Yeah, and it ended up being like a seven-year gap between now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the Maiden never did it, apart from yeah, the Matter, matter of Life and Death. death but oh, they just, hey, mind you, if they did, oh, we're going to do Number of the Beast in full. You'd be like, yeah, that's that's three years of <laughs> yeah gone. Yeah. Um, and then when did they end up? You know, that's it. Yeah, I mean, you you talking about obviously live bands playing albums live and full of I've seen. The two, pot, the two live streams I've seen recently, which is obviously the way we're the only way we're going to get live music for the next fucking two years. Down did Nola, yeah. 25th anniversary, and they played it. They actually fucked with the uh, the order. They started with uh, they started with a song, and I'm like, fuck, have I come in late? Have I have I missed after yeah. the fucking set? But I actually changed the order around just to freshen it up, which is pretty cool. And then actually at the weekend. Lamb of yep. God did their uh, first live stream where they played their brand new album in full. Yeah. And um, that it's fucking, sh- that Slade, they were tight as fuck, man. I mean, it was, and it's a, it's a good album. No one's fucking really caught on to it yet, but I fucking love it. It's one of the I've best albums I've listened done. to it yet, to be honest. It's, it. there's no standout single on there. You know, it's not, a, it's not an ash, it's not a redneck or a ruin or a fucking late the, late the rest. It's just one to ten, bosh, quality. Some albums are like that. Sort. Yeah, some albums, it's like uh, the standout track isn't, you don't really need one either. Like yeah. This is meant to be played. 
as an album. Listen to it all the way through. And uh, but what what would you if you were to uh, what what album would you like to be seen done live like in your what maiden or just in general maiden maiden summer and time yeah one of the best things I've ever done I've, no I'm not I've, that I've, that's just surprised me no I mean I yeah. I fucking love that album I, I would I, I would have thought you said Seventh Sun or maybe a later album no no you know, don't get me wrong Seventh Sun yeah. it's a classic but Summer and Time man I mean the sound of that album the futuristic all, all, fucking like, sound full album front full album yeah yeah oh, full album that's a Okay. One, one to eight, I do not skip. Boss, well, straight away through. Yeah, okay. I've never... Yeah, that's fucking flawed me there. It's all right, fair yeah. enough. No, I mean, I'm not, when, don't when disagree get, in any way, yeah. but... When we, when we get round to it, I'll, obviously I'll, yeah. you know, I'll review the shit out of it because it's, it's fucking great. No, I like that album. It's, you know... It's the one yeah. everyone claims. Yeah, he got shit at the oh, time. Oh, it's in between Power Slave and Seven Sun. Oh, yeah, it's fucking better than both of them. I think he got shit at the time because of the keyboards. I don't know. What yeah, the fuck yeah, it was. It's keyboards. That's I, not heavy metal. I, I, know, I find the people that like somewhere in time the most are actually my generation. Yeah. A lot. Of, and I think a lot of people do appreciate a lot of Maiden retrospectively. They don't really get the hang-ups of what was going on at the time. They just see X it as Factor. it was. <laughs> so, go on, what was that? X Factor. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're still waiting. You and me have got, um, what is it? We're going to be owed a lot of money when people finally cotton on that that album's good because we've oh, been mate, fucking telling I've everyone. Got fucking ruined in college because I like that album. Oh, it's fucking shit. No, it ain't. Hmm. You know, it's bollocks. But no, we're we're, we're digressing, obviously. Yes, <laughs> but, but that's um, fine. We'll that's get, fine. That's what these shows are all about. Are. But we'll we'll get there. So where are we now? Um, we're we're well, coming we've done up. the clips now. We're at the uh, track the eight, deep mate. cut, a song that's not known, but they yeah. they hardly ever play live. A song that another band wrote. Oh, whoops! whoops. Oh, fucking hell! <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that cunt. I hope he got his money. You know, I hope he enjoys it because I've heard the version he wrote. Yeah, it's similar. The lyrics are the same. But let's face it. What song would you prefer to listen to? That one or Hallowed? I know, mate. But look, it, it's bigger than that. You, What kicked this off was the whole Robin Thicke thing with the Marvin Gaye song. Yeah. And it's going to open Pandora's box, mate. That, that If this carries on, oh, music's going to be fucked. Because the guitar has only got six strings. And yeah. The piano's only got so many. There's only me, it's so many melodies it's, and scales you can use. Someone's it, it gonna cross about, over eventually. It, for him, it, don't, it, this geezer's a prick. It's all about him getting fifteen minutes because he settled for like half a million. Fucking half a million. You're yeah. saying it's Maiden's, you know, Maiden's song. You know, the, the greatest. And Rod Smallwood's probably done the thing quickly. He's gone right. It's going to cost the fucking solicitors. Yeah. Plus our time, plus our my time and thingy. You know, how, much, how much to fuck off? Right. Yeah, half a minute, right? Done. Right. Which, yeah, which tells me, song. which yeah. tells me, he's all about the fucking money. It weren't about the song. It ain't about like his stuff being written and used elsewhere. So the geezer can fuck off. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. And it's the same with the Marvin Gaye thing. To be quite frank, um, you know, and, and his family right fucking milks it. Oh, the pain that yeah. the, this is cold stuff. Fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> it makes your teeth itch, doesn't it? It's just yeah. like, stop it. It's about the Benjamins. Be honest. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, get that shit out of the way. The greatest heavy metal song of all time. Where, yeah. What's, what's your stand on it, Joe? I love it. Um, funny enough, I just want to digress quickly. Um, <laughs> Gavin, led by voices, there's a song that you pointed out on the second thing you mean. He's nicked that off of Pantera. And when I told him, Luke said that you nicked this riff off of Pantera song. <laughs> the Pantera song was the studio tracks at the end of the live album. And he was That's like, I don't know what hell. song you're on about. And he went, yeah, on the live album, you've got two new studio songs and the riff of da 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 da, you've nicked off that. And he's like, I've never even fucking heard that. <laughs> he fucking went off on my... 
But he was gutted. Hell. He was like, I've never heard it. I've never, like, and then I played it to him and he did, it was like, he was like, shit. I'm surprised ripped he off. had me in the band. Fuck yeah, he was like, like, Sorry, Gav. He, uh, <laughs> he, but when he heard it, he even went like, I, I flipped off a song I didn't even know, I've not even fucking heard. But that goes back to what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. How many, yeah. And how many strings and how many fucking, you know, yeah. how many frets are there? Um, yeah, so that basically was the top of that story. That's why I felt the need to tell it. Mm. But um, yeah, Hello Be Thy Name is a song that, a bit like Run to the Hills, I was burnt out on. I would happily never hear it again. Uh, it used to piss me off that they used to play it every single <laughs> show. And it was just, you don't have to drop it, but just drop it for a little while. Go go away, let me miss it and bring it back. They did. You know? They dropped it for Book of Souls because of that. They, I know they did, yeah. <laughs> but um, every so often you, you get sick of a song and you don't hear it for a little while and then you do and then it comes on. And I think it might have been something like Planet Rock or something. It just, like, completely out of nowhere. Like, last thing in my mind, I'm in the car and just, boom. And, and fucking Planet Rock of all places. I mean, they're pretty good. It's not a bad station. Yeah, but, they have their moments, don't they? Yeah, but generally it's pretty pedestrian. Every so often they chuck in a a curveball where you go, yeah. fucking you know, hell. Right? But yeah, just, boom. Dun, 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 dun. Fucking hell, what I made in the plane. And I was really taken in by the song where I hadn't heard it so long. The atmosphere in that opener, the um, the lyrics. I never really listened to the story of the song, but I, I was there. I was in it. I was I was in the gallo, ready to yeah. face me doom, you know? It was... And just, you know... The sands of time for me are running low, and then the, and then when it finally kicks in, it's just fucking brilliant. And oh, I just love the, how the Bruce note. just holds the note, oh, the note, the note, oh, yeah, oh, oh, and just holds it whilst the band are all going on. No, imagine the so, Arno singing it. Yeah, yeah, I know <laughs> it's not happening, but no, that's what it just goes back to what we say. It, it, yeah. it had to happen because to do stuff like this. Yeah, of course. Um, You'd be stupid to argue anyway, because look at the success they've had. It's as simple yeah. as that. So well, it obviously worked better yeah. or worse. Um, but it's still great live as well, because obviously the atmosphere, it's all dark and it's just him singing. Yeah. And then the band erupts. Yeah. But and he's it, still there because he's not. He, takes on, he doesn't kick in with the band or no, jump or yeah. yell because he's still holding the note. So he still yeah. stands still. And it's, it's just brilliant. Yeah, I mean, um, it takes on a life of its own live as well, doesn't it? Obviously, it gets big gig speed, a bit faster. You've got the fucking crowd. Because as good as the studio version is, the live version, fuck it. Whatever, whatever fucking tour you want to pick it from, the live version blows it away. And it's what I like about, goes back to what I was saying between Clive and Nico. The way Clive played this, if you hear the live version with Clive on and the studio version with Clive on, and then you compare it to the way Nico plays it, Nico gives it more balls, gives it more life, a lot more life for me. Yeah. And, he, you know, he's honouring what Clive played, but he just fucking, he takes it to a whole new level. And uh, live, fucking hell. I mean, it actually, when they've done it for Legacy of the Beast, ah, oh, the fucking hairs on the back of my neck are well yeah. up. You know, tears in the eyes. It was a fucking iconic moment in metal for me. And it, oh, it was so good, mate. I mean, and I, I love playing it whenever if I'm playing drums, when it comes on in the headphones, playing the song is awesome. And um, yeah, I'll tell you, like when I, Machine Head do a fucking really good cover of it as well. They recorded it for the Blackening Sessions. Yeah, it's a you bonus have, track on some. Yeah, if you haven't heard it, you should, you should check it out. They do a really good version of it. Do you know, and, don't do a bad version of it, it's Cradle of Filth. Cradle of Filth, yeah. Yeah. But say... So, uh, Going back to Machine Head, I mean, when they played the uh, Burn My Eyes tour at Brixton earlier on. Oh, recently, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they played it then. And the entirety of Brixton, sold out Brixton Academy, sung every fucking word. Really? And it, it was a moment, mate. And yeah, you tend these kids, like, obviously, these geezers in their fucking 60s who had grown up with metal, and there was kids in their 20s who probably only heard Maiden three weeks ago. But mm. every person was just singing every word fucking um flynn sometimes he stopped singing and let the crowd carry on it oh mate it just shows the shows the quality of that song that 
Walking Machine had a band who are, are fucking they're hundred miles away from Maiden style. Yeah, of people. course. Yeah, and their fans are hundred miles away. But that song, everyone for that seven and a half minutes, that was fucking heavy metal, mate. And it was for me the greatest metal song of all time. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's a good way to end it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So <laughs> next week we'll be doing peace of mind. Doing scores. Oh shit! Yeah. yeah um, do we need to? It's got Hello been unnamed on it, so yeah, it cancels yeah. out. Well, yeah. no, it don't. It only gets a nine. That's fair. That's because yeah. I, fucking hell! It's a big leap forward from killers. Oh, killers yeah, right. fucking hell! Yeah. But if this had, had total eclipse on instead of gangland, it would have yeah. eleven. We'd be in spinal tap territory. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I wouldn't swap total eclipse for gangland. I just wish total eclipse was on it. That's yeah, all. Sa- yeah, saying that, yeah. Um, but you know, would it would it fit it on? The I, old final I honestly don't. Gully would have been good at this. Actually, he's pretty good at going drop this, but then open with that or put. Yeah, yeah, swapping the order I around. Know, but I don't know what um, with invaders. Again, it's this weird song that it's to open the song album and nothing else. It got news; it never got used again. Yeah. And I don't know where, what I would swap it round with, but and I'd yeah, Gangland definitely. Could you open with, could you open with Gangland? I open Killers with a drum fill. It's upbeat, short, sharp to the point. Another band. Probably could, but I don't know about opening a Maiden concert with it. Maybe second song. I'm about the album, not not uh, not. A oh, tour. yeah. I mean, oh, sorry, I thought about, you meant live. Sorry. Oh no, sorry. We're getting cross no, I'm talking about the album. You nah, fuck that. Invaders. You couldn't open the thing. Imagine going from Killers and then picking this up and new singer, new thing in. Think, you know, like. <laughs> nah, no, nah, couldn't happen. Maybe Total Eclipse, maybe, but I like Invaders. It's a, Oh, no, I do, yeah. yeah. You, you know, but like you say, it's telling that it never got, never saw the light of day again. Yeah, but like I say, it just it, it, it's an icebreaker. There you go. Yeah. That that song just broke the ice, and I bet there was a lot of build up and a lot of anticipation for the album at the time. So I think this oh, was been, again, yeah. just been. a little tension breaker. And that's probably why. And it also the fact that it was a reworking of Invasion. It probably yeah. helped keep the older fans on side. That it's oh, I, I sort of know this. Mm. subconsciously sort of hooking them um for me personally it's an eight out of ten um i think i am a little bit burnt out with number of the beast and month of the hills it's it's the highs definitely you know they say a, a rising tide floats all the boat floats yeah. all the boats and the heights of the album do lift the bottom up and there's no bad song on it as such, but I just prefer Killers and Peace of Mind, really. It's, um, you know, it, it's it's not, I don't think, their best album by any shot. It is probably their most important. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of what they needed to do, and it certainly was the first domino to be flicked in a lot of other areas. Yeah. But... Yeah, I, I think they went on to do. I think the best is yet to come, album wise. But yeah, obviously, some of the best songs are on this. So it, for me personally, it's, yeah, it's an eight. Out, I'll give an eight out of ten. Mm. On that note, yeah, peace um, of mind. On, next yeah, time, peace of mind next. And um, yeah, thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. Indeed. Please Thanks do stick with us because we're in for the long haul. Here. Yeah, fucking hell. We've got a journey and, uh, coming. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a long one, but um, we're going to have fun with it. So share this round as well to your mates, to your Iron Maiden groups and all the rest of it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Laters. Bang.